to stop being a coming at you. I don't know if I'm ready. So it's hard enough just getting your rabies shots or whatever the hell you're doing. Yeah. Getting your rabies. No, I'm just joking. Okay. But like tetanus, everything. Like, what? And you feel like you're getting like a poking <laughs> prod. What is that? You know what I always do when I get flu shots? I always pull back on the syringe a little bit and put like like this much air in it. I'm not supposed to do that. Work's telling me I gotta wear a mask when I work because I refuse to get my flu shot, so I have to wear a mask till April. So you trying to get a flu You're kidding me. Yeah. That's insane. Anyways, the reason I do that is that when you you poke it in, right? And you push it in, that little bit of air creates like a little air seal there, and it doesn't leak out. I know, you're probably looking at me, you were taught never, you've got to get all the air bubbles out. <laughs> <laughs> you know how much air it takes to kill somebody? It takes about 20 cc's of air. So a big syringe about oh. that big, that's how much air it takes. So a little is not it not at all. What to get air? Yeah, but you don't like if you put twenty cc's in. Yeah, you 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 know you kill people. They get an air embolism and boom, you're dead. There was this uh, lady. Um, do you know what Munchausen syndrome is? Munchausen syndrome is where people will injure themselves or take stuff to make them sick so that they have to go to the hospital and get they get attention from being sick. Oh. Like a hypochondriac? Like yeah, exactly. But then there's another one, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. That's the mom, right? Right. The parent gets attention because she's having a sick kid. So I was dating this girl. She was a nurse in, at Children's Hospital. And they suspected every time the baby came, uh, the mother came to see the child, the baby would code. Like, they would stop breathing, right? So what they found, um, they decided to put cameras in, and they had to put cameras in every room, as opposed to, you know, so it wasn't singling her out, you know? Oh, yeah. And they found out that she was um, giving them air, uh, her baby air embolisms through the central line. Can you believe that? I hope she doesn't have that baby. Uh, no, she got a license for a daycare, I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's terrible. Can you believe that? Mm -mm. I don't know why anyone could harm a child. They're just so innocent. And, you know, just... Well, people are sick. All right, here we go. I'm going to explain to you, I'm going to write this down, right? So there's a question that says, uh, how is oxygen and carbon dioxide transported in the blood? And you need to be very detailed about this, yes? So with respect to oxygen, we talked about this, right? One of the ways that oxygen is transported in the blood is dissolved in the plasma and it's measured as a PO2 or a partial pressure, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about that. Number two is that oxygen is bound to the iron on hemoglobin, right? And then we talked about the fact that how oxygen knows to let go and uh, knows to bind. Right? So that was the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. By the way, there's a video on it called the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Was Can that you believe that? In no, this is oh, okay. uh, one for advanced. So it but talks about PO2. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the ways carbon dioxide is transported in the blood. And carbon dioxide is a little more unique. So let us begin. All right, so what's this? You don't want, I, I gotta do it. Sixty. Ah, oh, sixty-four. They're not perfectly 
terrible. Come on, that was fun. I hate me too. <laughs> Here we go. Want this whole thing, people? What's this? real quick. They have this uh, health alterations class uh, right before uh, I teach my pathophysiology class. So I'm walking by this one classroom and all of a sudden I hear, what up G? <laughs> 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 so they were talking about diabetes. <laughs> There's like three people. <laughs> what up G? <laughs> That's so stupid. All right, here we go. What's a byproduct of metabolism you got the cells got to get rid of? Oh God, thank you. All right. Where's carbon dioxide highly concentrated? Right. There's only one carbon dioxide. <laughs> it's inside the cell. <laughs> All right. Here we go. All right. So, and carbon dioxide is going to, by pressure, move from the cell into the blood. So one of the ways that carbon dioxide is transported in the blood is dissolved in the plasma of the blood, as a, and it's measured as a PCO2. You got me? PCO2, PCO2 so the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Now, what's this? Yep. How did you know? It's in the blood. <laughs> And it's red. <laughs> See? All right. What's the protein found in a red blood cell? What does oxygen bind to? Iron. That's good. I didn't even finish that question. All right. Now watch. The hemoglobin has a, what's this? Please get this. Nice. That came out of nowhere, Ethan. Every once in a while, you, you just have these pearls, you know? <laughs> All right, so carbon dioxide gets bound to the amino group. And there are four amino groups in a hemoglobin molecule. So how many carbon dioxide molecules can hemoglobin transport? Yeah, good. I'm only writing two, though, just so you know. Are you following? So, one way dissolved in the plasma. Second way is bound to the amino group on hemoglobin. In your book, it's called carb amino hemoglobin or carboxy hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. All right. The best way and the most important way is what I'm about to explain to you next. The third and final way. Watch. When CO2 gets dissolved in the plasma, that CO2 by diffusion will move from the plasma of the blood into a red blood cell. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. So watch, now you got CO2 in the red blood cell. It's gonna combine with water and form what? Carbonic acid. Nice, carbonic acid. And carbonic acid will dissociate into what? Hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. Nice. Look at him. Did you drink some A&P juice today? Maybe those rabies shots you got. Thank you, man. Yeah, they might have altered your intelligence. All right, now watch. If those hydrogen ions remain free floating, what will happen to the pH inside that red blood cell? it will become more acidic. So remember, I told you, like our first quiz we had, 
you have this protein called hemoglobin. Ain't that right? It's inside the red blood cell. So the hydrogen ion formed from this chemical reaction will actually bind loosely to the hemoglobin molecule. And if that hydrogen ion is no longer free floating, what did hemoglobin do to it? It buffered it. See, yeah. Now what you have is you've handled the hydrogen ion. What you have to do now is you have to handle that bicarbonate ion, right? And remember the law of electroneutrality? Remember that law? How could you forget it? I mean, for real. All right, wait, hang on. Whoops. Come on. So what you have here is you have a bicarbonate ion. You have the hydrogen ion loosely bound to the hemoglobin. And bicarbonate is readily diffusible from the cytoplasm of the red blood cell into the plasma of the blood. What charge does bicarbonate have? Negative. So to maintain that law of electroneutrality, a chloride ion from the plasma has to move into the red blood cell. That's the chloride shift. And the function of that chloride shift is to maintain the law of electroneutrality. How many people followed that? Now, so the vast majority of carbon dioxide is transported in the blood as bicarbonate. Now, if you write bicarbonate, PCO2, and bound to the amino group on hemoglobin, you're not going to get a lot of points. I need this process explained to me. Do you follow that? Now, as it says here, this is at the systemic capillary in the cell. Where does all that venous blood now go? The right side of the heart. And the right side of the heart pumps that blood where? Mm -hmm. To the lungs. So what you have here, and oh, if you remember, well, you probably won't. And I, it's okay, because you're studying for the midterm, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The PCO2 of venous blood Anybody know it? Nice. I didn't even expect you to know that. Hmm. What's the PCO2 of alveoli, Elise? You're on a roll. Here. Have some tape. <laughs> it rolled right underneath that spleen. Do you see that? <laughs> All right, so the PCO2 in the alveoli is 40, right, millimeters of mercury. Now, watch it, watch it. How is the vast majority of bicarbonate transported in the blood? Come on now. Guys. How's the vast majority of carbon dioxide transported in the blood? On the what? Bicarbonate, that's very good. Very good. Now watch. You got this loosely bound hydrogen ion to the hemoglobin, so it's buffering it. Now watch. And then you have the bicarbonate ion here. As the PCO2 begins to drop, as the PCO2 begins to drop, and CO2 is an acid, don't we know it? Bicarbonate, will, which is a base, moves into the red blood cell. Who's with me? Where was chloride? Chloride was inside the red blood cell. So to maintain that law of electroneutrality, chloride's going to leave. Who's with me? When bicarbonate enters, it's going to change the pH of that red blood cell because bicarbonate is a base. And that hydrogen ion can't bind there no more. It will combine with bicarbonate. Who's following this? Guys, a little bit? 
A little bit, just a tiny bit. Oh yeah. And it will, f oh no. This is the cloudy screen of death. I don't know. Well, but since we got this, why don't we try it? Ready? The wheels of the bus go around them. <laughs> Did you see the wheel, though? It's going round and round. Why did the bicarbonate go back into the red blood cells? As the PCO2 begins to drop, CO2 is an acid, right? Yeah. If the bicarbonate doesn't go back into the red blood cell, you'll have a relative excess of base. So to help maintain that pH, the red blood cell is going to, or the bicarbonate's going to go to, or inside the red blood cell. So yeah. Uh, what's this? Well, oh, darn it. That's a real turd. Lost that. Maybe it doesn't like the lungs. No one likes the respiratory system. Even PowerPoint. They don't like it. It always happens. All right, so let's recapitulate. That's the wrong word, by the way. All right. So you got this protein inside a red blood cell. Yeah. You have the hydrogen ion loosely bound. The PCO2, according to Elise, is 45 in the venous blood, and PCO2 in the alveoli is 40. That's very good. So the PCO2, by pressure, is going to leave the capillary, go into the alveoli. The result is, is that to maintain that pH, the free-floating bicarbonate that's out there has to move back into the red blood cell. And to maintain that law of electroneutrality, chloride will have to leave. Say yes. So we've got PCO2 leaving. we got bicarbonate coming back in. And bicarbonate is a base. It will make the pH inside that red blood cell alkaline. So when the bicarbonate comes back in, that hydrogen ion that was loosely bound will now become free floating. And it will combine with carbon or bicarbonate and form carbonic acid, say yes. And that's going to break down to CO2 and wawa. And the CO2 will diffuse into the alveoli. There's an enzyme that catalyzes that chemical reaction, and it can catalyze that chemical reaction both ways. Does anyone know the enzyme? Come on. Um, LDL? What is it? Carbonic yeah. yeah. That's insane that you remembered that. You can take that ruler when you leave. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ethan, you can take that ruler. And then what you can do is at home, you can draw two curved lines and then use that to measure, see if they're equidistant. So hydrogen binds with bicarbonate and then you see the two different stuff. And then when the hydrogen binds with the bicarbonate, it's going to form carbonic acid. And then carbonic anhydrase is going to reverse that chemical reaction and cause carbonic uh, acid to break down to CO2 and water. And then the CO2 will simply diffuse into the alveoli. So the vast majority of carbon dioxide is transported as bicarbonate ions through this little chemical process. Say yes. See? Isn't that good? All right. That's how carbon dioxide and oxygen are transported in the blood. That's really good. All right, what other questions we got? Yumi ain't here to show me the questions. You know, she should get a demerit. Hey, do, do blue pants go with this? Are those blue pants that you're wearing? Yeah. It didn't look like Yeah, they look blackish. Oh, good. 
<laughs> black goes with it, right? Yeah. Would blue, would blue, blue wouldn't go with this? A dark blue. Well, yeah, like the dark really blue like dark. you have. Like a dark blue would have. Oh, okay. But I thought about that, and I thought the uh, Denver Broncos, their colors are like this. Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know people detested that. <laughs> well, you know, live and learn. <laughs> My freaking kid took my credit card. <laughs> well, he asked. He, I was going to say, he took it or you, he asked? <laughs> yeah. He would have took it without asking. He would have be, he'd be one-handed. Take a machete and chop it off. <laughs> Bless you. All right, here we go. Here we go. Bam. I just did number five. PO2, PCO2, I did that. Explain why the PO2 of the atmosphere is higher than the PO2 in the alveoli. I did that. Uh, DKA, I did that. I did asthma, yes? No. No, I don't think so. No? Okay. Um, I explained chronic bronchitis? Yes. Okay. And I explained to you the surfactant, number 17? Did I explain that or no? No. Okay. All right, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go over how increasing or decreasing ventilation affects the pH, uh, asthma, and then I'm going to go over, I explained how carbon monoxide kills you, right? No. No? no? Okay. I explained the tension pneumothorax? Yes. Okay. And then um, that's it. Number 16, number 16 will be extra credit. There's a video on pulmonary function and its importance. Say yeah. yeah. All right, so I'm going to do number Elise is the only one that knew this. You're going to tell me again. What's the PCO2 of venous blood? What's the PCO2 inside the alveoli? Watch. Watch. If I sit here, and I'm not any more metabolically active, and I start doing this. <laughs> yeah? I will be blowing off more CO2 than I'm actually producing. And we know, uh-oh, If you would embrace this, your life would be so much better. You would probably become three inches taller, 20 pounds lighter, and you'd probably win the lottery. All right, so watch. If you're blowing off more CO2 than normal, that you're going to have less CO2. You got me? So which way is the equation going to go? Less CO2, because you're hyperventilating. Probably to the left. Not probably, exactly to the left, right? Mm -hmm. So the hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion will combine to form carbonic acid. If bicarbonate grabs that free-floating hydrogen ion and locks it up, can it affect the pH? If you prevent this hydrogen ion from being free-floating, can it affect the pH? No. What do you mean, no? I would think, I don't know. I guess not. <laughs> 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 she wasn't expecting. Watch. 
what does bicarbonate oh what does bicarbonate do to the hydrogen ion it buffers it right so if you prevent free floating hydrogen ions from being free floating what happens to the pH it goes up that's very good so hyperventilating is going to cause a respiratory what that's very good a respiratory alkalosis and what's going to happen to nervous activity as a result of respiratory alkalosis Isaac? neural activity increases that's why these people like they complain of numbness and tingling because the nerves are firing so frequently do you ever play that uh, hyperventilation game yeah yeah uh, why don't we try that? Everybody choke yourself. <laughs> All right, so what would decreasing ventilation do? I cannot hear you. I got a, got a letter in the mail from um, the state of Washington. I'm illegally deaf in that state. I can't go to that state anymore and hear anything. <laughs> Just that thing. <laughs> hmm? What's going to happen to the pH if you're not breathing so good? Be more acidic. Thank you. It will drop, right? Because you're building up CO2 and CO2 is an acid. Yeah. So in this case, if you're building up CO2 because you're not breathing like you're supposed to, it's going to force the equation this way and the pH will become more acidic. What does an acidosis do to respiratory or do to neural activity? It decreases it. So acidosis leads to coma. Yeah? Hmm. So when people come in, like I'll give you an example of something that could happen. December 15th, you look on WebAdvisor and you see your grade, and you're like, <gasps> And you start hyperventilating, right? Then you go to the emergency room, what do they do? Oxygen. You got plenty of oxygen. What do they do for you? Um, they give you Valium or they make you breathe into a paper bag, not a plastic one. And by rebreathing your own CO2, because CO2 is very low in the atmosphere, that will help. Um, lower the pH. If they're not getting rid of CO2, then you got to find out why they're not getting rid of CO2. But the most common acid-based disturbance, listen up because this is true, is an acidosis. No one's going to come into your emergency room and say, <gasps> I've been breathing like this for 18 years. <gasps> you got me? So. If somebody's had a heart attack and they stop breathing, or they have asthma, right, or they have some kind of airway obstruction, um, that's going to produce an acidosis. So, yeah. All right. Okay. I'm going to go over asthma now. Write this down while I'm finding this. Write this down. Brittany, are you writing it down? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm typing it. Oh, eh, it's the same thing. People with asthma have allergies. And an allergy is one time the body does stuff that doesn't make sense. Uh, an allergy is where the immune system overreacts to something that it shouldn't overreact to. That's the definition of an allergy. So what's the primary function of the immune system? What's its primary function? How does it protect you? It produces inflammation. That's how it protects you, right? So remember I told you, and I'll never forget it. It was a Tuesday that um, 
you get arterial vasodilation. And I also explained to you that the respiratory lining is very vascular. There's tons of blood vessels, tons of arteries in that lining. You got me? So, hang on, let me do this. So the hallmark of asthma is basically, it's not basically, it is, is inflammation within the respiratory lining. And it primarily occurs in the lower airways, the bronchioles. So here's a dude from Blue Man Group. You ever see that Blue Man Group? It's pretty cool. I always wanted to. But you decided to read the textbook instead? Of course. Yeah. All right, Carol. Now write this down. You got some alveoli? And then you have the bronchioles. The bronchioles are primarily made of muscle. And again, what are the two things that muscle can do? Relax. Nice. <coughs> that should be a midterm question. You know what? I'm going to add that. Right? So if you pull a joker, there's going to be some jokers in there. You can pick any question you want. And if you say, Tim, I want to do the muscle contraction, I say, okay. All right, rock on. All right, here we go. Watch. Watch. Who's watching? Brittany, are you watching? Okay, add a girl. Here's the respiratory lining. You got me? Now, this is where people get confused, so I'm going to try and unconfuse you. If the blood vessels dilate, What's going to happen to the size of the airway? Will it get bigger or smaller? smaller. Small. It will get smaller because when the blood vessels dilate, they dilate inward. So what's going to happen to the, your airway? Your airway is going to get smaller. Say yes. Better write this down. Better not pout. In the bronchioles, the respiratory lining has beta-1 receptors. What binds to beta receptors? And don't say beta. Epinephrine. And when epinephrine binds to beta-1 receptors in the blood vessels of the bronchioles, what does it cause the blood vessels to do? Constrict. Say yes. Do you see this? All right. Now, in the muscles, the smooth muscle of the bronchioles, you have beta-2 receptors. What binds to beta-2 receptors? Epinephrine. Now, through a different mechanism, which is, um, for me to explain, is beyond the scope of this course. I always wanted to say that. Okay. When beta-2 receptors are stimulated by something like epinephrine, it's going to cause the smooth muscle to relax. And what will happen? Relax. And what will happen to the diameter of the bronchioles? It will get bigger or smaller? It will get bigger. You got me? So the blood vessels dilating cause the lumen to get smaller and the muscles, the muscles in the bronchioles will actually begin to spasm in asthma. So that's really the hallmark of asthma. You get what are called bronchospasms. Now, in the upper airway, you want air to flow turbulently. And the reason for that turbulent airflow is to clean the air of any bad stuff. But when you get into the lower airways, you want that air to flow in a laminar fashion. Who's following? Randy, you following? What are you drinking? Iced tea with lemonade. Okay. <laughs> That's an Arnold Palmer, you know that? Did you know that? Yeah, but this is a, this is what <laughs> Wait, I don't understand. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, is that what it's called? Yeah, oh, I know there is like a brand. That came from a golfer, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. He stole my idea. Just like Joey bag of donuts. What the? Oh, okay. Ready? Ready? Okay. So, write this down. 
exaggerated immune response, the, prim will you, the primary function of the immune system is to produce inflammation. And it produces inflammation by causing massive arterial vasodilation. Are you with me, guys? Inside the respiratory tract, there are specialized cells. These cells are called mast cells. And in the respiratory lining, mast cells release a chemical called leukotrienes. <coughs> and leukotrienes cause the smooth muscle of the bronchioles to contract. Say yes. Leukotrienes. Luke. Luke. Leukotrienes. Who's following this so far? Guys? They cause them to spasm. Okay? Constrict and spasm. Then you have the respiratory lining. So watch. <clears throat> I'm allergic to cats, like deathly allergic. So if I see a cat, I pet it, of course. Here, kitty, kitty. Then their cat dander and cat hair, you suck it in. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to make this cat dander black because it's evil. Who has cats here? Anybody? Just so you know, the best you can hope for in this class now is a B minus. <laughs> so you got cat dander in there. If the immune system produces a response, this exaggerated response, what's going to happen to the blood vessels inside that respiratory lining? They will what? They will dilate. So what's going to happen to the lumen size, the diameter of that bronchial? It will get what? Smaller. So what's going to happen to resistance to airflow if that happens? That's very good. So you're going to get increased resistance to airflow. And the only way to overcome that resistance to airflow is by trying to create a greater pressure difference between the atmosphere and inside your lungs. And how do you create a greater pressure difference? by creating a greater lung volume. So people with asthma, watch, I'm fine, I'm making futures at Gateway, cat walks by, hair kitty kitty, pet it, suck in the cat dander, get an exaggerated immune response, these blood vessels start dilating and the hole gets smaller. So now, to overcome that, I have to go, <sighs> say yes. And what does that exaggerated immune response do to the bronchioles, the smooth muscle of the bronchioles? It will cause it to spasm, right? So instead of the air flowing nice and layered like it should, the walls will begin to spasm and airflow will flow turbulently. And turbulent airflow produces wheezing. That's why they wheeze. Say, yeah. Uh, if you get this right, it'll be good. What does epinephrine do to all of your blood vessels in your body? Constricts them. What does epinephrine do to your bronchioles? It causes them to dilate, right? Now watch, watch. When do you get a lot of epinephrine circulating? You're when you're scared. So you're get, that's preparing your body to run or fight. So when you're running or fighting, do you have to get more air in and remove more CO2? Yes. So it makes sense that epinephrine causes the bronchioles to dilate. Say yes. See how this works? I'm, I'm, I'm really doing a good job today. I don't care what you guys think. Ready? So one of the ways to treat asthma is by taking a drug that
that mimics epinephrine or mimics the sympathetic nervous system. They're called sympathomimetics. Ain't that nice? So when someone's having an asthma attack, you give them an inhaler, right? You give them an inhaler. It's called a rescue inhaler. And what's in the rescue inhaler? Pseudoepinephrine. Right. A drug that mimics epinephrine. It, you probably heard of it, Ventolin. Have you heard of Ventolin? Never heard of Ventolin? Pro Air? Okay, watch. So when you take a little hit off your little albuterol inhaler, here. Yeah? That Ventolin, which mimics epinephrine, is going to, you better write this down. That Ventolin, which mimics epinephrine, is a beta 1, beta 1, add. Trenergic agonist. Oh, oh, how many people want to be a beta 1 adrenergic agonist? Agonist. -ist. That's an S. You got me? And that's a fancy way of saying that epinephrine or drugs like epinephrine stimulate beta-1 receptors. And when you stimulate beta-1 receptors in the arteries that line the respiratory tract, what do they do to the arteries? They constrict them. So now with the constriction of the arteries, what's going to happen to the size of the lumen? That lumen will get what? It will get bigger because the blood vessels have constricted and the people say oh I feel better but they may still be wheezing what do you have embedded in the smooth muscle of your bronchioles you got beta 2 receptors and venolin or drugs that mimic epinephrine bind to beta 2 receptors and when they're stimulated beta 2 receptors are stimulated it's going to cause the smooth muscle to relax and what's going to happen to the diameter of the bronchial watch my hand it gets bigger. So you get bronchodilation. Say yes. So what are some of the side effects of rescue inhalers, drugs that mimic epinephrine? Tell me you got that. Do you follow that? So if you know what a drug does, you can predict its side effects. That's true education, Randy. I mean, for real. And you know who will explain that to you? That's asthma. Watch. What started all this mess? The cat. All right, we should kill him. <laughs> what started all this mess? The immune, the immune system exaggerating its response, right? So if you get a heart transplant, what did they give you so that your immune system doesn't look at that new heart and say, hey, that ain't me. I'm going to kill it. What did they give them? wrong and that's not how you play the game. <laughs> if a person has a heart transplant, what drugs do they give them so that the immune system doesn't look at that heart and say, hey, that really ain't me. I'm going to attack it and destroy it. I did. Well, clearly I didn't. I went over it. Right? You didn't learn it. So, Ethan, no yardstick for you, buddy. Something with the recognition. Well, there's letters. What? The phospholipid membranes. Because that's how the cells recognize other cells, is the membranes. Yeah. That, that won't fit in there. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Uh, Since she didn't know. <laughs> you get well, there's 26 letters. You? You? There's an I and a me and Timmy and no you. Steroid. Oh. Where? Oh. <laughs> I'll just connect it now. <laughs> uh, it's, they give them steroids. Steroids suppress the immune system. What's the primary function of the immune system? To produce what? Inflammation. So watch. If you hurt your back from carrying the textbook around, and it's, you're really jacked up, the doctor will give you prednisone. It's a steroid that reduces inflammation by suppressing the immune system. For the crowd. Did you follow that? No? So I have a question. When I was sick, they prescribed me prednisone. If it suppresses my immune system, why would they give it to me when I was sick? What was wrong with you? Right, right. Watch. We're not perfect, even though some of us like to believe that, right? Um, because the inflammatory response is, it, it's not perfectly controlled in that area, right? Watch. You twist your ankle, right? And you maybe damage some tendons, but your whole freaking ankle swells up. It's not just the area where you damage the tendon. Do you follow? So they give that to reduce the inflammation because, well, look, you asked for it. Now you got it. Huh? I said they, gave, they prescribed that to me too for five days when I had shingles. Right. Right. It hurts, right? Oh, man. I would not, I would not wish that upon anybody. Right. Was your throat really bad? Yeah, like I couldn't talk. There you go. That's why. Okay. So, I'm, I'm not going to get into that now. I'm, I, I'm not. But when we get into the immune system, I'll explain you, to you why they do that. All right? So, if you have allergies, it's the immune system responding too much. So, what do you want to do? You want to say, hey, they're a big fella. Don't overreact. <laughs> right? So, you give them steroids to... Uh, suppress the immune system. So now I'm taking steroid inhalers, right? And can't walk away, hair, kitty, kitty, and pet it. And when I suck in the cat dander, I'm not, my immune system's not going to overreact. How many people follow that? That is, of course, it's beautiful. Now watch. What people don't know is that it takes about three to four weeks of continued steroid inhalation to adequately suppress the immune system. So you know what people do? They have this attack, or they have a kid who's had an attack, right? Then they treat it, okay, Joey, nebulizer, okay, good, here, suck on the, on the, the steroid inhaler, and here, give it to mommy. I'll have a little too, why not? And once the kid starts feeling better, they stop taking their steroid inhaler. What you need to do is continually give that steroid inhaler every single day so that it continues to suppress the immune system and say yes. And most people stop taking it when their breathing becomes better. And they don't know that. That's where, as a nurse, you need to educate patients. See that? So there. They also tell you when you take your steroid inhaler to rinse out the back of your mouth. Do you know why? Watch, even adults don't know how to take that inhaler, right? They suck on it like it's a freaking giant straw, right? Or so you shake it up, you hit it, right? Suck it in. Some of that stuff hits the back of your throat. Steroids suppress the immune system. So the immune system gets suppressed locally in the back of your throat, and you get a fungal infection called thrush. That's why they tell you to rinse it out. What about the ones you don't have to take every day? Like what? Like 
Oh yeah, that's that's the mildest. You, you don't need. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, people who have exercise-induced asthma, dry, cold air makes airways reactive. It precipitates asthma. So that's why, like, uh, if you have exercise-induced asthma, a lot of these people they go into sports that are moist and warm, right? Like cooking. <laughs> Uh, they go into swimming, diving, stuff like that. They stay away from sports that are out in the cold, dry air. Say yeah. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Does it keep recording when it went bad when the screen went? Oh, no. Oh, yeah. That's going to have that bad recording. Mm-hmm. Look at that. All right. Tell me you got that. Guys? Feel good about that? How many people feel good about asthma? Huh? Anybody got a kid with asthma? No. Well, go 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 get one. <laughs> Adopt one. Uh, oh, I forgot to tell you one more thing. What produced the bronchospasm? I won't expect you to remember that. These little chemicals called leukotrienes. Remember that? Oh, yeah. So there's a drug that's been out for about 25 years called Singular. It's a leukotriene inhibitor. Okay. okay. You got that? All right, let's do this. This is a fun one. Uh, especially this time of year. Uh, there was these... Uh, this uh, guy and this girl, right? And their parents wouldn't let them have sex in the house. So they went out to the car in the garage and they closed the garage door and it was getting cold, so they turned on the car. And they both woke up dead. So, um, and I think they were like, you know, like 38, 39 years old. And can you imagine? Your parents not letting you have sex in the house at 38 or 39? I really want to. I don't think I could. Well, I mean, if they were there, you know. So this is just even if they're not there. Yeah, but they're, if you're 38 or 39, you shouldn't be living at home. Yeah, no kidding. Why are you living there? Right. I don't understand that. Yeah. Who lives at home still? Unless yeah. maybe their house burned down. Bunch of slackers. Or lost jobs or something. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I'm going to do? I think I'm going to be a, a slumlord. But I really beat up places, you know, hey, we'll live there. Pay me money. Or a pimp. But a nice pimp. Not like a mean pimp, you know. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> this, I'm going to give you extra credit, not even play it. What's that? Yeah, you guys got extra credit. What's the protein inside of red blood cell? That's very good. Okay. What binds to the iron on hemoglobin? Chicken? What binds to the iron on hemoglobin? That's very good. Now, watch. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, CO, is a gas that's produced by burning fossil fuels. Gasoline, right? Natural gas. Tell me you got that. So carbon monoxide is colorless and odorless. You do not know that you are being exposed to it. But this is how carbon monoxide kills you. Carbon monoxide and oxygen compete for the iron on hemoglobin. Are you with me? Now watch. When oxygen binds to the iron in the lungs, when it gets down to the cell, what does the oxygen do? What does it do? 
What does the oxygen do when that red blood cell gets down to the cells? Right, it falls off the iron and goes into the electron transport chain. You follow? And then that venous blood comes back up and you attach another one. Carbon monoxide and oxygen compete for binding iron. If carbon monoxide wins, it don't let go. Do you understand this? So how many irons are in each hemoglobin? Four, so I'm only going to do two for edification. So if you're being exposed to carbon monoxide, right, every time that red blood cell, that desaturated red blood cell comes back to the pulmonary capillaries, if a carbon monoxide binds there, it won't let go. So what does that mean in terms of the amount of oxygen you're actually delivering the cells of the body? It will go way down. Here's the other thing. Carbon monoxide, when it binds to iron, produces that red color. So people who've died from carbon monoxide poisoning, they never looked healthier. They got these rosy cheeks, these ruby red lips, right? But they dead. Tell me you followed that. That's why if you watch like the news, they say, oh, these people were exposed to carbon monoxide. You see the ambulance guys, right, the paramedics? They got the person on oxygen, right? So watch. And this happened. Guy used to sit right there. This was like four or five years ago. And a student came in and sat there. Did I tell you this? And he did this. He'd like walk back and forth like you're sitting in my seat, right? And there was like going to be a confrontation. I'm like, are you guys out of your mind? Who cares where you sit? But he was like this, just staring at her. I'm like, that's, you know. Oh, he's a girl, too? Yeah. Oh, come on. Anyways, I told him, next time, just push her off. <laughs> How hard is that? <laughs> so watch. If carbon monoxide and oxygen are competing for that seat, right? If carbon monoxide is on the seat, the only way to get carbon monoxide off that seat is to push it off. Do you understand? The PO2 of the, of the air in the alveoli is 100. Sometimes that pressure isn't enough. So you have to apply more pressure. That's why they will give them 100% oxygen. And when that does that, that increases the PO2 in the alveoli. So start pushing them off. If that don't work, then they place them in a hyperbaric chamber where they crank up that PO2 really, really high. And then it's like, <laughs> say, yeah, uh, tell me you got that. Yes. That's how it works. So I always forget this. I always forget that. Hang on. There's a myth that carbon monoxide lines should be installed on the lower walls because carbon monoxide is heavier than air. In fact, carbon monoxide is lighter than air. So carbon monoxide is lighter than air, right? So watch. That's why in the mines, they would have these little birds in cages and they would place them up high, right? So if they're digging for gold, right? And then all of a sudden they see like little a Jerry Parakeet, right? He's like, tweet, 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 like that. They knew to get the hell out of there because they were being exposed to carbon monoxide. So uh, if you have like a two-story house, put your cat on the second floor. <laughs> See, yeah, that's how that works. That's carbon monoxide. Bam. All right, hang on. <coughs> You need to get this. You need to get this. All right, watch, watch, watch. In the alveoli, in the alveoli, when you take a breath in, what does, what do the alveoli do? Inflate. Yeah, nice. So just 
Did you just feel it? Yeah, watch. Good. Your alveoli will expand. Say yes. When you blow that breath out, the tendency is the, for the alveoli to collapse. Is it moist and meaty in your lungs? All day. So you better write this down. In the lining, in the lining of, someone up. In the lining of the pulmonary capillaries, I'm sorry, in the lining of the alveoli, why is this not working? Oh. Write this down. In the lining of the alveoli, you have these specialized cells called type 2 alveolar cells. And these cells secrete a substance called surfactant. And surfactant is not produced by these type 2 cells until the baby is approximately seven months old. Now, the baby's lungs are completely developed. They simply lack surfactant. And what surfactant does is it prevents water molecules from sticking together. Watch. When you don't read the textbook, right, and you're reading something else, like, you know, the National Enquirer, because that'll get you a good grade. You lick your finger and you turn the page. The reason you do that is because water makes things sticky. So when you blow the breath out, the tendency is for the alveolar walls to stick together because it's moist and meaty in there. Are you following me? What prevents the water molecule from sticking together? Surfactant. So if a baby is born before the seventh month, they'll take their first breath, doctor slaps them on the ass, and the kid goes, <gasps> what the? Right? And now when they blow that breath out, without surfactant, the alveolar walls will stick together, and they will develop a condition called atelectasis, and they will go into respiratory distress. So they have to be placed on a little baby ventilator to increase that pressure to open up and keep those alveoli open. If they know the baby is coming early, they can give the mother a synthetic form of surfactant called surfacan, and the baby will start producing surfactant even though it's coming early. When the baby's on the ventilator, they can actually administer surfactant through the endotracheal tube so the baby doesn't have to spend a lot of time on the ventilator. The more time the kid spends on the ventilator, m more complications. So like in surgeries, and for anyone, it doesn't matter. You want to get them breathing on their own. Say yeah. And there's a uh, condition, a genetic condition called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. I'm not going to get into all that. But it's a genetic condition where they don't make surfactant. So they have lung problems. Really bad. When I was doing home care, I took care of a lady who had alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So the first day I go there, I have to do like this intake, right? Ask her all these questions, do a health history, all that stuff. Anyways, she goes, can we take a break for a minute? And I'm like, sure. So she takes her oxygen off, goes outside, and has a cigarette. Okay. Did I do that? Did I answer all the questions? Which ones do I got to do? I went over asthma, carbon monoxide, surfactant. Increasing, decreasing respiration. I think I covered them all, right? Did I? Ethan, you're what? What? You're, you're slipping. You're slipping. What's a, What's eleven? It'll take two seconds. Write this down. Indorol is rarely, is rarely given anymore, but it can be given, but it's, uh, it's an absolute contraindication to uh, people with asthma. What receptors are embedded in the smooth muscle of the bronchioles? Beta 2. Beta -2. Indorol is a non cardioselective beta blocker. It blocks all 
beta receptors. All beta receptors. So if you block beta 2 by taking Inderol and you have an asthma attack, can that drug that mimics epinephrine bind to that beta 2 receptor? So they will have a, they can die from that. That's why their Inderol should never be given to a patient with asthma. See how this works? What's that? Patients with RA, that's like arthritis. Right? They give them what, Enderol? Yeah, because I've seen it before. I just can't remember. Yeah, I don't know why they do that. Do they do, don't they? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if they do that. Tell me you filed that. So people can experience hypoglycemia, and if they're on Enderol, and then they won't be able to break down glycogen, so their blood sugar will continually drop. Remember beta-3 receptors in the liver? See how this all works? Nobody cares. All right. That's respiratory, yes? Did I answer all the questions? I believe so. I wasn't here last Friday. Oh! Oh! No one was here this last Friday. I think the only one that showed up was Ashley. Yeah, so I gave her a ton of extra credit. I was here. Oh. Could have worked with that. There were only like four people here, though. Yeah, there were only people. My classes are going to get smaller and smaller. Right. You think it'll continue to get smaller? Oh, what, now? I don't know. Oh, it might, because I might not show up. <laughs> <laughs> it would be smaller. All right, so this is what we're going to do. Uh, take a little break, and then um, I want to start the kidney. I got to go. I, we got to get moving. Well, don't look at me. Don't look at me like that. Uh uh. We got to do it, guys. So I'm teaching a pathophysiology class. Yeah. I might take that as an elective or something in the summer. Yeah. Is that a requirement? No. Look at all the, like, there's like seven choices. People think multiple guesses is good. <laughs> That's just wrong. Huh? Mean. That's just jacked Yeah. Well, that's what they do in nursing school, so. I always thought it was a requirement for nursing school. Patho? Is yeah. The dean, she retired, but she would always tell me, uh, Tim, nursing students don't do optional. That class is filled every semester. Showed her? Yeah, I did. Ah, and I, you know what I said to her? Ha. <laughs> okay, here we go. Just give me until like uh, 1 o'clock, and then you can ambulate, okay? Don't hate, ambulate. You should really caption that or like uh, copyright that. Don't hate somewhere. ambulate? That's what somewhere? I'd wear, I'd wear a church. Right? That'd be cool, right? Do Don't hate ambulate. Yeah. And I'm first. You know what? I'm going to do that. One, Forget the uh, class is over. Okay. We're going to go make you some t shirts. <laughs> Are you taking care of your split ends there, at least again? Yeah. All right. I forgot that. See, I don't have any hair, so I don't have to worry about it. I think yeah, it's your all like of them are cold. split ends. Huh? Your hair like it's cold. You know, this is really weird. It's like the little hair that I do have, if I shave it, like, you know, shorter, I can actually feel the difference in terms of, like, when it's cold. My little bald head gets very cold. <laughs> so you know what I do when I'm driving? I just rub it. Because what does heat do to blood vessels? Yeah, well, forget that. <laughs> What does it do? It dilates them. See? The more warm arterial blood goes to my little bald head, and I feel better about myself. <laughs> All righty. Here we go. Here we go. Here's the kidneys. Are you ready? You don't like the kidneys, do you? No. People don't like the kidneys. The kidneys are the stepchild of the body. Nobody talks about them until they do something wrong. You know? All right, let's get rid of this. We're not going to need this.
this guy. <clears throat> All right? So you got two kidneys. I'm gonna, you learn this in general, so I'm going to go over this very, very briefly. Very, very briefly. Watch. You got two kidneys. Write this down. And the kidneys are considered retroperitoneal. Retroperitoneal. Meaning they are not inside the peritoneal membrane. You got this big hefty bag that kind of wraps all of your abdominal organs in it. The kidneys are outside of that. They're in back of that. This is what allows peritoneal dialysis, bless you, peritoneal dialysis to be effective. All right? So, um, and then the kidney's primary job is to filter, you better write this down, that's a bad color. I like the color, but you can't see it. I'm going to try this one. Oh, oh, really good. Filter plasma. So the formed elements of the blood, the larger constituents of the blood, are not filtered by the kidney. They remain in the blood. So if you work in a hospital, that's Spanish for hospital, and a patient gets uh, urine, you dip it, the things that they look for are um, red blood cells, white blood cells. Did I say that right? Uh, white blood cells and um, albumin. And the reason you should never find this stuff in the urine is because it's too large and it can't be filtered out by the kidney. So anytime you have any one of these three in there, that is a sign that something's going on and it's bad. Tell me you got that. Okay. So once the urine is formed by the kidney, it filters the plasma, that urine is then drained through these hollow muscular tubes called ureters or ureters, right? And what are the ureters made out of? Muscle. muscle, smooth muscle. And they contract and relax just like your GI tract and peristaltically wave that urine into the bladder. And the ureters actually enter the bladder underneath. So urine kind of bubbles up like a little fountain. We got a little fountain of urine. And it will enter the bladder and the bladder has barrel receptors and they will sense pressure and as the pressure increases in the bladder it will initiate the micturation reflex and you'll go like this you're like studying not reading the textbook and you're like gotta go got me and this is what I'm going to attempt after class I'm not going to go pee and I'm going to try to make it to my next class Right? You do too. You get like, I'm not going, going to pee. I'm just going to get in my car. Then you hit that bump, you know? Oh, should have peed. Then right before like, you pull in a driver, like, oh, no, I ain't going to make it. See, if you're a guy, that's cool. I just go in the back of my garage and pee. Right? Women, they got to, oh, it's all kinds of trouble. All right. So, and again, you got two kidneys. You can live with only one. Um, and that's good. And the reason we uh, have two kidneys, they believe, is that uh, the kidneys um, needed to work a lot harder because a lot of that bad stuff that would enter the blood, the kidneys had to filter out. We eat good stuff like trail mix. That's good for you. Tell me you followed that. All right? Okay. Now watch. What's the byproduct of glucose metabolism? What's left over after you metabolically break down glucose? Fat? It's the same. Protein is different. I want this whole thing. When you eat protein, that protein gets digested and then absorbed into the bloodstream and everything that you put into your pie hole goes through the liver first. Are you with me, guys? Liver first. So that amino group that's connected to that amino acid 
the liver will hack it off and it will convert it to ammonia. And then the ammonia will get converted to a less toxic water soluble compound called urea. You've heard of this? We talked about this. And metabolism, correct? So the byproducts of protein metabolism, the one that you have to handle is urea. So urea, there's a little ammonia in there that you get rid of, right? But not toxic levels if your kidneys are working good, right? And urea and ammonia make up what's called the blood urea nitrogen. So both of these compounds contain nitrogen and they get dumped into the blood. The only way to get rid of them is um, to have it filtered out via your kidney. You know, did you ever wake up in the morning and your, your, your breath smells like piss? I've woken up where it smelled like crap. Like I got, I woke up out of a sound sleep because my breath stunk so bad. Like my head was like buried in that pillow. I'm like, damn. So that's blood urea nitrogen. How many people followed that? Now watch. If the kidneys are being damaged, right? The kidneys aren't working. What's going to happen to your blood urea nitrogen? It's going to go up, right? Now watch, watch, watch. If a person has liver failure, do you want them to have and eat as much protein as possible? No. no. Because they will not be able to deaminate it and convert the ammonia to urea fast enough. And the ammonia will begin to build up in their blood. And when that ammonia builds up in your blood, um, it can cross the blood-brain barrier and you can get uh, brain swelling and go into what's called a uh, hepatic coma. So yeah, do you want that? No. And if you have kidney failure, do you want to eat a lot of protein? No, because then you can't adequately filter the ammonia and the urea. So if you understand how protein is metabolized, and you'll understand why the liver and the kidney are important, and if both of those organs or either one of those organs aren't doing so good, then you need to limit your protein intake. The other one that you have to get rid of is through the byproduct of metabolism. And you store ATP in skeletal muscle in the form of creatine phosphate, and when it is broken down, it is broken down to the waste product creatinine, and that gets dumped into the blood. And the only way to filter it is by the kidneys. So the two tests used to assess kidney function are blood urea nitrogen and creatinine. And creatinine is considered the gold standard. You guys just don't like that, do you? I think that's clever, you know, create the gold standard. <laughs> well, I'm just going to sit back here and enjoy that one. <laughs> so what they look at is what's called a like creatinine clearance. Have you ever heard of the 24-hour creatinine clearance? Have you heard of that? that? So the patient collects their urine for 24 hours, and they actually measure the amount of creatinine that they're dumping into the urine, right? And that's really a, the best way to determine it. Um, uh, the other thing they look at is what's called glomerular filtration rate, GFR. Have you heard of that? Uh, when we get into the nephron, I'll explain that. So these are the things that the kidney has to get rid of. These are the big waste products. So one of the functions of the kidney is to remove metabolic waste, right? And I just discussed that. The other thing that the kidney does, and when I get into the nephron, it will be even more crucial, is that it's intimately involved in acid-base balance. And it is involved in it by controlling the levels of bicarbonate in the blood. And again, this is really important, and I told you about this in quiz number one, that the kidneys, if you live long enough and you maintain kidney function, the kidney can correct any acid-base disturbance in the body. That's why a lot of patients, if you work in the ICU and people are really not doing well, what they will do is they will put them on temporary dialysis just to try and get their electrolytes and their fluid level and their pH back to normal. And when you do that, people will start recovering a little better, hopefully. So people who suffer from um, shock, sepsis, stuff like that, you want to get them on dialysis to uh, filter that blood and to try to maintain that pH. All right, so that's a big function. We'll talk more about that later. The other thing that the kidney does is it maintains um, electrolyte levels. And 
Uh, I'm just going to tell you this. I'm going to write this out. This is very important. Uh, you should consider getting this on a um, T-shirt too. Okay. Absolutely. Like, are, are basically on a renal diet and yes. they have to watch? Okay. Yes. Yeah. They have to watch how much potassium they take in, too. Now, this is important. When the kidneys fail, begin to fail, all the functions of those kidneys begin to fail. But the uh, functions that involve involve energy, meaning the kidney has to expend energy to either to get rid of it or bring it back into the blood. Those are the ones that go first. So there are two things that the kidney has to actively secrete into the urine to get rid of. Those are hydrogen ions and potassium ions. So that's why when people go into renal failure, they develop a metabolic acidosis and the associated hyperkalemia, their potassium goes up. You got me? And the reason that that happens, and you'll see this in the early stages of uh, renal failure, is because they have to actively secrete hydrogens and potassiums to get them out of the blood. And that involves energy. And that's one of the first things that begins to fail when your kidneys begin to fail. Okay? And I'll talk more about, about the electrolyte stuff um, as we get, as we matriculate through this. All right. Now, the other function of the kidney is to uh, maintain long, bless you, maintain long-term, long-term blood pressure. And it does it through basically uh, um, two mechanisms. The simplest one and the one that we know is uh, pressure diuresis, right? Anytime you increase your blood volume, that will increase your blood pressure and that will force the kidney to make more urine. It's purely mechanical. The other one is through what's called the um, renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And um, I'll answer that specifically. Here's my point. Um, the kidney is involved in long-term blood pressure control. So if the kidneys are failing, can people with kidney disease have as much water as they want? No. They have to be on a fluid restriction because they literally can drown in their own bodily fluids. They can go into severe pulmonary edema to, due to fluid overload, and um, that's the end of it for them. The other thing that the kidney does, and we're relating this to respiratory, is it monitors um, oxygen saturation, O2 sat of red blood cells. And if the kidneys detect a drop in O2 sat, the kidneys will release into the blood a hormone called erythropoietin. What does erythe mean? Erythe. Erythema. What does erythe mean? Come on, you had how many people have medical terminology? Well, that's no excuse. You should know it. Uh, erythe is red, right? Poetin is not eating well. How you eating? Poetin. Poetin means to form. So erythropoietin forms, stimulates the bone marrow to increase red blood cell production. Say yes. And again, when organs fail, all the functions of those organs fail. So they will not have a stimulus for increasing red blood cell production, so red blood cells will die. But because erythropoietin is not routinely being released, um, they won't make new red blood cells. So people who are on kidney and kidney failure, they develop anemia. So yeah. The other thing they they do is they store glycogen. We know about this, don't we? Don't we? Don't we? Oh yeah. I'm just talking to myself. 
Yeah. The other thing the kidneys do is they activate vitamin D. Vitamin D is first synthesized in the skin. And then it's further processed in the liver. And then finally activated by the kidney. So what do you need vitamin D for? Come on, Bones. Ethan. Bones. It's what? Like calcium. Uh, what? I don't know. Um, vitamin D is required to absorb calcium from the gut. That's why vitamin D supplements, um, our calcium supplements, are usually fortified with vitamin D to aid in that reabsorption of calcium. Yeah? All right. What else? What other functions? I think that's pretty good. I think I got them all. So yeah. So those are the functions of the kidney. Now, what I want to do is I want to give you a brief overview of the anatomy because you had covered this in general. But I'm going to do this uh, very, very quickly. All right. First of all, write this down. I'm not going to write it down. You got, I got mine. Arterial blood is the blood that's filtered by the kidney. Why? Because it's under pressure. And then, and then once that blood is filtered, it leaves the kidney through the renal vein, and the renal vein connects to the inferior vena cava. And it brings that cleansed blood back into the general circulation. What's the gland that sits on top of the kidney? The adrenal gland. And as we know, as we know, glands are divided into two anatomical parts, typically. Right? You have an inner portion, the medulla. Also, she's a lady that if you look at her directly, you will turn to stone. The medulla. And then you have the outer portion of this gland, which is the cortex. And we learned, well, I shouldn't say that, we went over the hormones that are released from the adrenal cortex. Uh, those are uh, cortisol, DHEA, and aldosterone. Aldosterone, uh, we're going to revisit in a little more detail. All right, that's important. All right, so uh, I'm going to do the math for those of you who are math challenged. How many people here are challenged by math? No one? Okay, add a count. All right, watch. How much blood does the normal person pump per minute? Five liters. Yep, five liters per minute or 5,000 cc's per minute, right? So, watch, 20% of your blood, 20% of your blood is being filtered by both kidneys every minute. So, how much blood goes through the kidneys, both kidneys, each minute? How much? One liter. How did Elise figure that out? Elise took five times 0.2. One liter, right? So a thousand cc's per minute. How many minutes are there in an hour? I'm waiting. So every hour, both kidneys filter about 60 liters of blood per hour. How many hours are there in a day? Well, on Tuesday and Friday, it seems like 98. So if you take 24 times 60, I believe it comes out to 1,440 liters per day that the blood is filtered through both kidneys. Do you pee 1,440 liters a day? Who does? Anybody? 
Come close. Ethan, how many liters of pee did you have today? I haven't, I haven't kept track lately. Oh. You know, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to invent a toilet that has those little marks like a measuring cup. Hey, 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 I peed 725 liters. What do you think? Would you buy that? Dude, I could have a stand outside. You buy t-shirts and, like, toilet bowls? <laughs> the hats? What <laughs> <laughs> you put your face? <laughs> you get old. <laughs> All right, tell me you got that. All right, so watch. You better, you better get this. Well, I don't care. All right, here we go. So I'm going to take this real slow. To make urine. The kidneys do three things. Number one, they filter the plasma. Number two, what was filtered gets reabsorbed back into the blood. Right? Now watch. So just so you know where I'm coming up with these words. When you eat something, it gets digested by your digestive tract and then brought into the blood. That's absorbed. If it was in the blood, got filtered out of the blood, and then brought back into the blood, that's reabsorption. Say yes. And three is secretion. Now, some things cannot be adequately filtered by the kidney, so they have to be actively secreted. We talked about this, the hydrogen ions and potassium ions, right? So once the kidney has gone through these steps, you will form urine. All right? So here we go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little cross section here. And I'm going to begin to explain to you some of the internal structures of uh, the kidney. And then we're going to talk about the nephron. And this is really important. All right, so let's look at this for a minute. Watch. Any part of an organ, any part of an organ where large structures enter or exit the organ, that's called the hilum. So the hilum of the kidney is where the renal artery, renal vein, and ureter exit or enter the kidney. And then, just like other organs, the kidney is no different. You have an outer portion, which is called the renal cortex. And then you have an inner portion, which is called the renal medulla. And the renal medulla is actually divided into these little, uh, what look like pyramids, right? So these are the renal pyramids. And then finally, what you have is you have these little cups right here. So you got a cup of urine, cup of soup, right? Uh, these are called the minor calyx. Calyx in Latin means cup. And then you have this area here called the major calyx. And I like to refer to it as the urine's commons area. This is where the urine goes to talk about their day. And they say, hey, how you doing? And he'll say, hey, I'm a little pissed off right now. Okay. Yep. Now wait. You can probably understand why I'm trying to put these classes online, right? I mean, you get it, right? All I got to do is cover the competencies. And if I don't get to know you or see you, I ain't going to care about you. 
right? So my life will become better. All right, so where does the urine meet? Urine's commons area, and then it's drained through these hollow muscular tubes into the bladder, and then you pee into the toilet or wherever. And yeah. All right, one of the things I'd like to point out, again, I'm not a huge anatomy guy, but a couple of times that you need to know some anatomy. If you look at the size of the ureter, the diameter of the ureter, as it exits through the hilum of the kidney, it becomes progressively smaller. So this becomes a problem when people develop kidney stones. And when that kidney stone tries to pass, that's when it is an issue. And know this, kidney stones are not like peri boulders, right? They are like ninja death stars, right? They've got all these kinds of jagged. And what they will do is you're trying to pass it, it will, that little jagged edges will dig into the lining of the ureter. And because it goes through peristaltic waves, you get this condition called renal colic. Basically, every time it tries to contract, you get these waves of shooting pain. And you don't want that. This class is painful enough, let alone a kidney stone. Am I right? Now, the other thing is, is that anytime you increase the volume of urine in the ureters, that will expand them. And as you know, probably, and Ethan, he's quite aware of this, right, intimately, that when you drink alcohol, it increases urine production, right? And then stretches out that ureters. That's why physicians will recommend that you drink some alcohol, beer, when you have kidney stones. And that way, by stretching them out, you try to, you know, uh, pass that stone. So I drink beer prophylactically to prevent kidney stone formation. I think I'm going to have a, little, a couple at night. I feel a little kidney stone coming on. Yeah? All right. Now watch. As you can see, as you can clearly see, who can clearly see this? You can the renal artery, when it enters the hilum of the kidney, it begins to split off into smaller and smaller arteries. I don't care if you don't know the names of those arteries, they probably will never come up again. What I need you to know is that those arteries get progressively smaller. And remember is that it's the arterial blood that's actually filtered by the kidney. And all of those, all of that those splitting and bifurcations occur and end up at the functional unit of the kidney. And the functional unit of the kidney is called the nephron. So this is where the plasma of the blood is actually filtered. This is where you make urine. So. What I want to do first is I want to show you a couple of things, and then I'm going to get in. I'm going to start going over the nephron. All right. Now look. If you um, if you ever saw a kidney and you actually cut it open, you could literally draw lines in the kidney, and what it would show is these changes in osmolarity as you move from the cortex of the kidney towards the medulla. So what I need you to understand is this, is that as you move from the cortex of the kidney deeper and deeper into the medulla, the osmolarity in that tissue of the kidney goes up. It's very important that you understand that. So as you move deeper and deeper into the medulla of the kidney, the osmolarity goes up significantly. Now watch. Here, here, right here, is the cortex of the kidney. Are you following me? And as you can see, there's this little um, yellow brick road. And it kind of traverses 
initially starting in the cortex, but then some of the parts of the little tubules will actually go deeper into the uh, medulla of the kidney. And it's important that you understand this. So what I like to call this is the yellow brick road. So we should follow it. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. Okay. So write this down. Write this down. The osmolarity of the blood is about 300 milliosmoles. All right? Stuff to water ratio. Remember that? Now watch. As you begin to move deeper into the cortex of the kidney, the osmolarity of the surrounding tissue, so this area here, this area here, right? That area. The osmolarity goes progressively up. So 600, then 900, and then at the bottom here, 1,200. So what you're seeing as you move from the cortex of the kidney into the medulla is an environment that is saltier and saltier, right? Lots and lots of stuff and not a lot of water. You got me? Now, as you can see, you have these little tubules. Write this down. Write this down. The tubules collect what was filtered. And what was filtered has a name. It's called the filtrate. Isn't that nice? Is anyone interested in naming their child filtrate? No? Filtrate wells. What do you think? Does that go good? It does. Right? Yeah. Hey, filtrate, come over here. Do your math. I don't need math. That's what filtrate will say. What are you going to say to filtrate? Shut up. Ready? The tubules collect the filtrate. Tell me you got that. That filtered plasma. And as that filtrate travels through the yellow brick road, the stuff that was filtered will get actively reabsorbed back into the blood. Are you following this? Now, as you move, right, remember I told you, some things can't be filtered adequately, so they have to be actively secreted from the blood into what is ultimately soon going to be urine, right? So these collecting tubules collect the filtered plasma, the filtrate, and then as it matriculates through the yellow brick road, stuff will be actively reabsorbed or it will be actively secreted into these collecting tubules and ultimately peed into the environment. One of the things that is hard to filter is this stuff called creatinine. And this creatinine has to be actively pumped into the blood. And if you remember what I told you, is that any process within the kidney that requires energy, those things begin to fail first. That's why creatinine is a better indicator of um, kidney function, because it's more sensitive in terms of how rapidly your kidneys are declining. All right? Okay, so I'm just going to go over a couple of uh, things, and then you can um, ambulate and don't hate. Now, how many people had one of those, like, uh, Play-Doh PlayStations? Did you have one? You put the Play-Doh in there and you kind of press this handle, right? 
and it looked like a turd shaped and a star was coming out. Yeah. Right. So when you apply pressure, it forced it out, right? So remember that arterial blood is the blood that's filtered by the kidney. And you better watch. There's a little arterial that begins the nephron. So this guy right here is a nephron. You're going to need to know the parts, right? And that little artery right there is called the um, afferent arterial. So this afferent arterial takes blood that's under pressure and brings it into this ball of capillaries. And a ball of capillaries has a name called the glomerulus. Have you heard of this? Glomerulus? Now, the glomerulus is actually a ball of capillaries, but it's actually more porous than a normal capillary. It has little slits in these, these capillary membranes called fenestrations, right, that allow more than normal plasma of the blood to leave. So let's look at a little closer view of the glomerulus. You got me? So what we're seeing here is the afferent arterial. And then you have this ball of capillaries, and this is important. And surrounding this ball of capillaries is the little capsule that begins, excuse me, that begins the, to collect what was filtered by the glomerulus. That's called Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule. And they're directly connected together. Now, if you recall, I told you that red blood cells are big, albumin's big, white blood cells are big. You got me? So as that blood is coming under pressure, right, the little Plato playhouse, the higher the pressure, the more of the plasma is filtered. Who's following this? Now watch. The formed elements of the blood are the big stuff that could not be filtered by the glomerulus. That leaves the glomerulus through the efferent arterial. So the efferent arterial takes the remaining blood that was not filtered by the glomerulus and it leaves the glomerulus through the efferent arterial. Now this is important. The efferent arterial, as you can see in this lovely diagram, oh, it's so lovely. So watch. You got the afferent, boom. Then you have the efferent, boom. The efferent then forms a network of capillaries that surround and come in very close proximity to the collecting tubules. And it is these paratubular capillaries, right? Capillaries that are surrounding tubes. And this is where stuff will get reabsorbed back into the blood or stuff that cannot be adequately filtered but has to be handled is actively secreted. So the paratubular capillaries originate from the efferent arterial. And this is where you get that stuff brought back into the blood. You got me? All right. Now, you can see little Bowman's capsule. And the first part of the collecting tubules and any time you talk about something that is originated closer to the starting point of an organ or a structure, it's called proximal, right? So these little guys here are called the proximal convoluted tubules, right? And the proximal convoluted tubules are made of cells, and there's pumps embedded in them where stuff can be actively pumped into the blood or it'll passively diffuse. And then as you can see, watch, the proximal convoluted tubules kind of thin out and they dive deep into the medulla of the kidney. This area right here with this thin portion is called the loop of Don Henley. 
Don Henley was singing on stage one day, and he thought, hmm, I bet you there's a loop that goes deep into the medulla of my kidney. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, what happened? All right, so you have a descending limb, then you have an ascending limb, right? Does it, ooh, 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 ooh. Then you have the thickened portion of the ascending limb. See how it was kind of thin, then it got thick? I told my girl that. I said, you were thin when I met you. Now you're starting to get thick. You like the thickened portion of the ascending limb. And I actually took this computer out and brought this up, and I said, look, that was you, now that's you. Yeah. Can you believe that? Did I told my students. Why's that? Did she stop you when you said that to her? No. <laughs> I told my students like a couple of years ago, and I just did a real nonchalant. I said, yeah, I weigh my girlfriend every time she comes down. And I'm, I'm like, I remember I'm turning on the TVs, and you're like, you you what? I go, yeah, I weigh her every uh, time that she comes down. And if she's up upon her too, she don't eat supper. And she looks at me, and the students look at me, I'd never date you, I'd never go out with you. I said, I ain't asking. <laughs> Do you think it would actually do that? No. <laughs> you know how I put it to him? Ethan, you ain't married yet, huh? Listen up, because this is true. Watch. I told my girl, I said, one of the things that I love about you is the way you look. You look good to me. Right? And if you put on some weight, I still love you, but I would find you less physically attractive. Is that fair? It's just the truth. Right. But when you really love somebody, it doesn't... Well, no, I mean, I, 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 I still love the woman, but I'm not gonna, like, hey. I'm just saying. David's my brother. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just a guy. You know what I mean? All right. Forget about that thickened portion. We're moving on. <laughs> the next portion of the little collecting tubules, all right, it's farther away from the origination of the glomerulus. This is called the distal convoluted tubules. Now, this, I'm just going to tell you this. This is where a lot of drugs are taken. These distal convoluted tubules are just, they're kind of low life. They love drugs. I need to start coke. Uh, this is where drugs are excreted by the kidney. So a lot of drugs, again, they have to be actively secreted. And in some cases, mm -hmm. drugs will actually compete with other things in the blood to be excreted into the urine. Listen up, because this is true. Watch it. I'm just talking here. There's a stuff called uric acid. Uric acid is the byproduct of the um, uh, uh, nucleic acid metabolism, right? So you eat DNA. Uric acid is insoluble in the blood, right? So you have to actively secrete uric acid into the urine to get it into the toilet. There's a drug out there called hydrochlorothiazide. Have you ever heard of it? It's a very mild diuretic. But hydrochlorothiazide, it works on the distal convoluted tubules, but it also competes with uric acid to, get, um, to be excreted into the urine. So if you are on hydrochlorothiazide and you get rid of hydrochlorothiazide, the uric acid elevates in the blood. That's why these little diuretics can cause gout. You know, we'll explain that to you. You know how many people will remember that? All right, ambulate. Don't hate. Would you actually buy a t-shirt that said that? Don't hate, ambulate? It's gonna have rich spots. Yeah, it's on the Yeah. yeah. 
I could drop one of my stick guys on there, you know, and where he's walking. <laughs> Don't hate, ambulate. All right, everybody's got their time. Say yeah. yeah.